conspiring against the Orthodox uh, community to usurp leadership by purposely making them look bad? I think that's absolutely ludicrous. There's absolutely no evidence for it. I think it's uh, complete nonsense. But if you want to develop that case, I mean, go ahead. Well, because I, I didn't know too much about it. Just talking with Adam King. And like, as I mentioned, that's how we got into the rabbit hole of conspiracy theory because, you know, he's he's on Alex Jones. Um, but I mean, saying that um, there's a fight in City Hall and with the communities of powers of who represents the Jews. And um, I assume in L.A., you know, so I was learning most of this from Adam King because I'm not familiar with like, uh, you know, city council or the power players, that there's probably a struggle between the Orthodox, uh, uh, you know, community leaders in the Federation and the ADL. And certainly what happened the other day is an opportunity for critics of the Orthodox community um specifically in the liberal Jewish community, uh, you know, not mentioning, not even to mention like, you know, anti-Semites or critics of the Jewish community uh, in general, but specifically from the liberal Jewish community to try to say the Orthodox community is incompetent and therefore, um, you know, they shouldn't, uh, you, know, uh, you, you know, you shouldn't take their community leaders seriously and you should let the ADL or Federation speak for them. Yeah, I don't think uh, there's, there's, much evidence of a conspiracy here. I mean, everyone's scrambling for power. And I'll say this socially, of all the groups I've known... Uh, forget, forget I use the word conspiracy. Right, yeah. I think everyone's always struggling for power in Jewish life and in non-Jewish life. But out of all the groups I've known, Jews are the least likely to follow, right? Jews are the toughest crowd if you're a public speaker. Uh, a lot of Jews want to be leaders. Not many Jews want to be followers. Well, have you ever been, because like, okay, Adam King happened to be at like the, you know, the council of community leaders that, uh, you know, was with that Mayor Bass called after this event that included the Simon Wiesenthal Center that uh, I guess there was even a mention that like, you know, only Rabbi Cooper came instead of Rabbi Heyer and Adam King had his organization. And, uh, you know, there was also your, your, your Malski or something like uh, if it's a Jewish city council. Zeb woman, Yaroslavsky. Yaroslavsky, that that you know, she he was the one she uh, King she was the one King was mentioning often that uh, that after the event um, where he came as a community leader that uh, the mayor and uh, you know this woman were distancing himself because people were claiming that he's a neo Nazi like you know he's coming as a legitimate representative of an Orthodox Jewish faction but once his picture was plastered all over the paper standing behind the mayor that people are like, that dude's a neo-Nazi, that dude talks with, uh, uh, you know, Alex Jones and Nicholas Fuentes and all these people. And now, um, you know, the mayor or, or this woman and other forces are, are distancing themselves from him. Yeah, well, a normal person would want to distance themselves from anyone associated with Alex Jones. So it makes sense that the mayor would want to distance herself from, from uh, King. It's n nothing I see is nefarious just common sense well and that's what i told him at the end and i kind of said like because he like went on like a rant for like 20 minutes i was like dude you're just whining and then like it said that he was like i will drop you in a second and i was like i do what you got to do but then he let me finish make my point where i was kind of neutral about group conflict and like i was kind of like you know, why are you surprised of course they're going to do that uh but uh you know he didn't feel that way that that uh that, you know he was deeply hurt and he, he's like how can you possibly think i'm a neo-nazi i'm the superest jew of all jews Right. I mean, who who has the time to do all the live streaming that uh, Mr. King, you know, myself and you do? All right. People who aren't married with kids. What kind of people aren't married with kids? People who are generally on the margins. And so people who are on the margins tend to hang out with other people on the margins. And people who are not on the margins generally don't want to be associated with people on the margins. I, I think he is actually married. I'm not sure if he has kids, but... Oh, okay. uh... But I mean, even that case, like, is saying, like, well, yeah, I mean, that's a deep hit to the egos because, like, okay, like, I've been a distance. So, you know, even as a kid, like, I kind of put myself, even as a teenager, that I was going to be a person on the margins and never really had hopes of being mainstream and designed my personality and positive feedback mechanisms as being someone on the margin. And maybe you also did that, although it didn't appear that King had that, like, he thought he was mainstream 
even though you know the evidence might be against that. And I'm not sure, uh, you know, the alt right or the people you follow, or even pornography, or various things like what people at a young age, uh, you know, determined that they were going to be an outsider, or or what people kind of take delusions despite everything that they're doing that think that they're basically normal. Well people who are in in the center of life who are popular and effective and loved and have you know popular successful friends that they such people never choose to marginalize themselves but if you're already on the margins then you'll be incentivized to make the best of it so what we've all done here is we've made the best of our marginalized status and, and just I mean, you could close the chapter on this just because I, I reminded myself right offhand why intelligent women become promiscuous or maybe you know, go into porn. And it probably starts with being smart enough to trick other people. So if you're a normal pretty girl in high school that's uh, you know, above average attractiveness and intelligence, and you think like, I could cheat on my boyfriend and get away with it because uh, you know, you, you re they realize that they're a little bit smarter than people. And, and eventually that comes back to bite them and uh, everybody figures it out and then they get labeled as a slut and either they you know, have to repent or they embrace it but it's that element of high intelligence that uh, causes uh and not necessarily like you know like that all porn people are geniuses they even like you know uh, people in low intelligence areas but they're smarter than their peers so even if you're an african-american woman growing up in the hood that the average slut is actually smarter than your peers, and that's what causes the descent into uh, um, you know prostitution or promiscu promiscuity many times. Yeah, I think the opposite is true. I think the promiscuous uh, woman is generally less intelligent than her peers. But uh, anyway, David, I'm going to move on. So thanks okay. for coming by. Yeah, that's great. Okay, take care. So I, I was. You remember COVID vaccine mandates? Uh, I didn't like. That, that topic uh, back in the day. So I had one or two inclinations thinking, oh, government directed vaccine mandates. I can kind of see the point for them, but I, I pretty quickly took the position that, that I don't favor government directed uh, COVID vaccine mandates that uh, I wanted people to have the freedom to choose. And then I read an essay in the New York Review of Books by Linda Greenhouse. So just, uh, fired up my New York Review of Books subscription a few weeks ago, and in the December 21, 2023 issue, An Unhealthy Definition of Rights, the new majority on the Supreme Court religious liberty takes precedence over the government's power to protect public health. And so I started thinking more deeply about the topic, and now I love the topic because how much freedom would I be willing to give up, all right, to create a safer public space, right? If more people are vaccinated, fewer people will get severely sick or die from COVID. We will have a safer, healthier society with reduced health expenses and less needless loss of life. So there is some degree of uh, human freedom that I would give up for those benefits. So generally speaking, in the competition between individual freedom and the public good, right? I, I'm fairly centrist, but uh, when I was younger, I definitely had much stronger libertarian inclinations. And then reporting on the porn industry made me think we need more regulations for the public good, that the libertarian approach is not a good approach for society in many things, right? Some libertarianism in, in society is, is good, so you can make the arguments for this or that. Let's uh, decrease regulation. I'm, I'm quite open to it. But as I get older, I am tending more towards the side of the public good. And so if you've got a fighting force, all right, why would you not want that fighting force to be at peak efficiency and at peak health and to do everything you can to reduce the chances of uh, the fighting force becoming ill, let alone seriously ill. So I can see, I can now better understand the case for mandated COVID vaccinations. So, if vaccinations have been proven safe and effective, I don't love the idea of government-directed uh, vaccinations, but I certainly align with creating incentives for, for people to get vaccinated. And one of the most powerful incentives to get people vaccinated is to make it uh, more difficult for them to participate in public life if they're not 
vaccinated. So I remember when I went to Australia, the first time I went to synagogue, I didn't bring proof of vaccination with me. So I did not get into the particular synagogue. So this was still in the height of COVID. This was November of 2021. I believe the, the vaccine had recently been released in the United States, but most people weren't being vaccinated. So I certainly believe in a public pos- policy that uh, strongly incentivizes getting vaccines that have been proven safe and effective. And I am open to government mandated vaccination in some areas such as the military. Uh, I'm more open to it now than I was yesterday prior to reading this article. Okay, so Steve Saylor is on Oren McIntyre. I'm not a fan of Oren McIntyre. He strikes me as a hyperbolic attention seeker. So I, I generally agree with him. Like, I generally agree with Tucker Carlson. I generally agree with Douglas Murray. Uh, but uh, certainly with, with yeah, with, with all of them, there's a lot of hyperbolic attention seeking, telling people what they want to hear. And so I, I get the sense with Oren McIntyre, the, the little I paid attention to him, that he's, he's very much producing a performative online output to, to meet the desires of a particular audience. So he's not someone I respect, but I, I recognize he's very smart. And I'm certainly a fan and of Steve Saylor. With social media companies to censor people like myself and others who speak on political topics. So if you want to go ahead and support me and everybody else who broadcasts oh, over. Okay. A reasonable guy who knows a lot of basic facts about this America, this, what the social science says, who observes a lot about daily life from a pretty normal point of view. And then I put it together in kind of a big picture that tends to scare people, I guess. That it's like, well, what if Sailor is right? Uh, then that would be horrible. Especially that would mean, you know, I've been wrong and therefore maybe he should have my job no that's the worst possible conclusion they can come to i don't know so it's been going on forever and i just keep doing what i do and uh at the moment i'm i'm sort of more popular than ever but (laughs) i've been doing this a long time yeah i'm not a big fan of the hug box where you talk to people that you just agree with and you tell a particular audience what it wants to hear I'm a big Steve Saylor fan, not an Oren McIntyre fan. I mean, I have a lot of ups and downs over the decades. Yeah, that uh, that kind of multi-decade overnight success there for you all of a sudden. Yeah, um, I started writing for National Review in 1994. I've been a full-time uh, opinion journalist since 2000. So, Okay, Glib Medley says something provocative here in the chat. 40, now older, perhaps weaker, so coercing the younger and the healthier is okay. Well, if you want to live in a society, you're down with coercion, right? Society gets anything done through coercion. You put people away if they're committing crimes. You make it difficult for them to avoid paying taxes. You require them to fulfill certain requirements if they want to own a gun or if they get a driver's license. So all societies, all communities rely on coercion. So it's not like, oh, this is something brand new and unique that uh, 40 is advocating something that is unheard of in human history. It must have something to do with 40's own physical health weakness. Look, how many lives are you willing to sacrifice to be against government-directed vaccine mandates in all cases, right? How how many years of life are you willing to sacrifice? So are you willing to have 5,000 extra American deaths each year at an average loss of life of 10 years, right? So that's your side, right? You're willing to put up with thousands of additional unnecessary deaths costing on average 10 years. And uh, I am open to the idea of a little more government coercion in the, in the area of public health, in, in particular with regard to vaccines, because for me, I see the argument that uh, preservation of life of my fellow citizens, reducing sickness in the public square, creating a safer and healthier and stronger society is uh, more important than allowing people the freedom to choose badly. For example, we mandate the use of seatbelts 
in some circumstance, wearing a seatbelt will cost you your life as opposed to not wearing a seatbelt. But overwhelmingly, seatbelts save lives. Overwhelmingly, vaccines save lives. So you, you I, I assume, Glib, that uh, you're not a fan of vaccine mandates. So you're willing to sacrifice thousands of lives to preserve the freedom to choose badly. And I am less inclined in that direction than I was yesterday. Gerontocracy drools. Well, Glib, Medley, uh, 2,000 people under 18 lost their life during COVID. Is that... Uh, oh, so it, we have various government academic surveys that show the average lives lost per, per COVID death was uh, placed around 15 years. So at, at what point do people lose any value? So you have contempt for the old people, right? Gerontocracy draws. I get it. You loathe old people. You don't think they have any value. You couldn't give a F if uh, hundreds of thousands of them die unnecessarily. I get it, right? You, you don't care. At what age do people cease to have value to you, right? For me, 80-year-olds still have value. 75-year-olds uh, still have value. You have contempt for the old. At what age does that, that contempt kick in? Is it, uh, say, five years above whatever age you are? And will you be down when you're 70 with other people having that same contempt for you that you have for 70-year-olds right now? Right? So just don't have to do a lot of reading between the lines. You have contempt for old people. You don't think they have any value. So when you get older, uh, you're going to be cool with that, other people recognizing you as having no value. What standard does a vaccine need to meet before it's eligible to be mandated? Does this COVID vaccine meet that standard? So I... I don't know enough on that topic. I recognize that the consensus of the experts was that uh, vaccines available in the United States of America were both safe and effective. Not effective as in perfectly effective, but they reduce your chances of dying and they reduce your chances of getting seriously ill. And the advantages of taking the COVID vaccine, as I understand it from the experts, uh, vastly outweigh the disadvantages, just as the advantages of wearing a seatbelt vastly outweigh the disadvantages. Oh, whoa, Glib Medley, my God. Glib says you win, bro. Logic and reason really coming through. Uh, I'm, I'm embarrassed. I mean, if, if, I can, if I can win with Glib Medley, then I can win with America because Glib Medley is the champion of the chat. I mean, Elliot Blatt, I love you. You're a wonderful guest, guest but different people have different gifts. And Glib Medley has a particular gift for the apocurrent. No, I haven't been boosted in almost, uh, I haven't been boosted, I haven't had a COVID vaccine. So it's now June, so nine months. Uh, Apocur, I, I'm not even sure how to pronounce this, but this is Glib Medley's particular gift. He may have many other gifts. He may be a sensitive and generous lover for all I know, but at Apocur, is a comment, a brief reference that makes an illuminating or entertaining point. Glib Medley, better than 999 people out of 10,000, right? Different people have different gifts. This is Glib's gift, right? He's better than 99.999% of people at making a brief, illuminating, or uh, entertaining point. So it, it's a great honor, Glib, that uh, you come to the show and you you give us these these blinding insights and and often provocations because if i'm just standing here talking to a wall I, I can't do the show i have to be provoked i have to be stirred up i have to be needled i have to have someone let me know that i'm mispronouncing something that i've gone boring so how the hell do you spell Ap do you pronounce apicure so let's see if there is a pronunciation here on YouTube, and then I will show you the word. Come on, bloody hell. Okay. I can't even see. Give me a link, right? If you know a link that shows how, how to pronounce it, I can't even properly read it. Here we, here, here's the word, A-P-E-R-C-U, upper, Aper, aperu, aperu. Comment or brief reference that makes an entertaining point. I can't even find. 
an example of how you pronounce it. Okay, here we go. Must be a foreign word. It's not fair dinkum Anglo word. Bloody hell. Just give me su. Aperçu. Aperçu. Sounds French. Aperçu. Thank you. Aperçu. Ah, it's a French word. Yeah, I was right. It's a, it's a French word. Oh, man, what's going on with Israel? Israel Hamas? releasing this. This is the number one news story that I've been following. Video right here that it says shows Hamas terrorists firing a projectile at a UNICEF aid convoy. That convoy heading to reunite children in northern Gaza with their families in the south. Now, the Israel Defense Force is saying it's more evidence that Hamas is jeopardizing the safety of Gazan civilians. Now, over in the north, Israel and Hezbollah in Lebanon appear to be on the brink of a possible war, with attacks by the terror group only intensifying. Do you want to talk more about all of the latest developments here? So let's bring in John. St okay, let's go big brained back to Amanda Alexander, her essay on how the P Palestinians successively copied the, Viet the North Vietnam, the Viet Cong narrative, and why that proved to be such a winner. So the theory of the people's war, remember, people's war is the communist theory of war, that anything is kosher to overthrow colonialism or imperialism. What is colonialism and imperialism? Once you remove any kind of moral judgment, you just purely go for description. So if you just purely keep it descriptive, colonialism and imperialism means more effective than less effective people. So colonialism and imperialism means that uh, if, if your group has, has been accused of colonialism or imperialism, what your group is being accused of is being effective, being more effective than the losers. So colonialists and imperialists are winners, right? They have won out over losers. So one definition of imperialism is to have influence. So if you are smarter than other people, if you are prettier than other people, if you have any gift that is above average and you deploy that gift, right, you're likely to have some influence. And as such, you are engaged in imperialism. And if you go around fertilizing women with your radioactive seed, you are engaged in colonialism. And if you take some care about the women that you fertilize, all right, you are engaged in eugenics. Scary, scary, scary stuff. All right, so theory of the people's war means the communist theory, the third world theory. It means the theory of losers, right? Communist Marxist Leninism, right? This is the, the third world theory of losers. And how, because they have traditionally lost to those who are more effective, the West, they are therefore entitled to break any kind of moral standard. They no longer have to be constrained by any moral standard. They can kill, rape, torture, slaughter civilians because their cause is just, because they're losers, right? This is the ethos of the loser. I'm a loser. My people have consistently lost. Therefore, I am morally entitled to do anything. It's kind of similar to the Trump uh, ethos after the 2020 election where Trump lost the election and then came out with all these bogus conspiracy theories and once you bought into them you were freed from any kind of moral constraints once you were freed from any moral co constraints things like uh, January 6 were inevitable right I if you say that the election system is rigged against your team then you're saying that your team is no longer bound to any kind of standard of behavior that you can do anything because the game is rigged against you and that's the same ethos of the commies, the third worlders, right? The, the elite theory of the people's war, the, the guerrilla war. Uh, we're losers. We've consistently lost. Therefore, we are free from any kind of moral obligation, right? And that's how, how people think on the left who support terrorism and Palestinian rights, right? Throwing in with the Palestinians means you, you throw in with losers, Right, you're a big uh, supporter of the Arabs or of Muslims. Right, you're throwing in with those who are consistently losing out to the West, which is consistently more effective. Right, people's war, and it is a whole new system of morality, a whole new approach to war, because in the traditional laws of war, you do not gratuitously slaughter and rape civilians. But 
the loser mentality, the third world mentality, the Palestinian mentality, the Viet Cong mentality is we are free from all moral constraints. Right? You have to be afraid of people with this kind of worldview because th there's going to be nothing that holds them back. Right? They will do anything. Right? The Palestinians will do anything. Now, anybody under sufficient stress will do anything to survive. Right? It just requires more stress for more successful people to stoop to doing anything. While people who have no success, right, what would uh, Palestinians be proud of? Like, what are their huge contributions to humanity? They, they don't have a whole heck of a lot to be proud of. Therefore, they take pride in their loser narrative and how it frees them from any moral constraints. All right, fundamental aspects of the laws of war, the status of national liberation wars, right, uh, completely contradict traditional understanding of the laws of war. But these Viet Cong and Palestinian narratives sh developed a subtle shift in the interpretation of the laws of armed conflict among the winners. <clears throat> all right, the West, all right, those who have embraced the Viet Cong and the Palestinian narrative and the anti colonialist, anti imperialist narrative are embracing the narratives of losers and identifying with losers because. Losers evoke some sort of special feeling that is so exquisite that it's not available elsewhere. Right? That's why identifying with the narrative of the losers is so popular among Western elites because it produces, it appeals to that nurturing instinct. And if you don't have children to nurture, or if you're not particularly interested in nurturing your own children, then the only way you can get those exquisite nurturing feelings taking care of helpless losers, right, and you're not willing to do it the traditional way by having kids or by caring about your kids or devoting yourself to your kids, you've got to have some outlet for that desire to nurture the absolutely helpless and hopeless and the losers. And so for many Western elites who are highly intelligent and highly desirous of the exquisite feels available for caring deeply about the losers, right, the Palestinian cause is one opportunity. And so it doesn't express itself that bluntly and honestly. Hey, I support the Palestinians because I get these exquisite feelings from identifying and supporting losers. Right? Nobody says that. But what you instead get is, oh, is Israel conducting itself justly against an enemy who has zero moral constraints? They feel released from all moral constraints because they're losers. And anyone who identifies with the anti-imperialist, anti-colonialist, communist narrative Right? They feel freed from all moral constraints. And think about how much easier life is if you've got nothing to preserve, if you've got no accomplishments to protect, and you have no moral constraints that you need to live up to. You can see why this would be appealing, particularly to uh, both uh, lower IQ people and those high IQ people who are desirous of a particular emotional sensation that's only available by throwing in with the narrative of the losers. So most talk about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is about Israel's nationhood territory and how Israel conducts its counterinsurgency against an enemy who knows no moral constraints. So you have growing disapproval of Israel's counterinsurgency tactics among Western elites, right? When Israel fights to defend itself and fights back against terrorists who know no moral constraints, Right, you have this widespread worldwide UN majority of nations supporting the guerrillas, the communists, the losers, the terrorists, the Palestinians. And so Western elites, such as Western international lawyers and Western countries, begin to question the legality of counterinsurgency tactics, right? Which are inevitable. If you want to survive and you're fighting a terrorist enemy, you have to employ counterinsurgency or you're not going to survive. So increasingly among Western elites, they question the legality and morality and the legitimacy of Jews wanting to live in the Jewish state, especially when Jews are killing civilian Palestinians in a manner that the elite regards as disproportionate. So there wasn't really a doctrine of disproportion prior to the 1970s. It was there, but it was very minor league. It was at a very minor key. But after the 1970s, particularly since the late 1990s, the number one 
international elite concern with regard to law is that you don't kill civilians, you minimize the killing of civilians, and your killing of civilians must not be disproportionate. So you have to restrict your military tactics to that which does the least damage to civilians, like a completely brand new in the history of humanity uh, approach to international law. And what is underneath it is the communist loser narrative that because we're losers and we've consistently lost out to those who are more effective and have developed a higher, more effective, more intelligent form of civilization, we are therefore freed from moral constraints. When you go up against an enemy freed from moral constraints, you have to use effective and often cruel counterinsurgency tactics. So the anti-Vietnam War movement and the pro-Palestine movement launched a comprehensive attack on the traditional understanding of the rules of war and traditional understandings of international humanitarian law. And in particular, a comprehensive attack on the way that the United States and Israel fought back against their terrorist guerrilla opponents who knew no moral sanction. And so you had this growing elite movement among human rights activists and international humanitarian lawyers whose only outlet for particularly distinctive feelings is to side with the loser narratives, to side with the people who know no moral constraints, and the elite in the fields of international humanitarian law and human rights you know, go to war against the United States and Israel. So you get the ginning up of popular protests, you get news media reports that draw attention to what Israel's doing wrong, to what the United States is doing wrong, and how they're being cruel to the terrorists who know no moral limits. And so you have an increasing focus on the suffering of civilians and children when the United States and Israel engage in counterinsurgency. And you have these leading elite Western intellectuals and journalists producing inquiries into these acts. They stage trials judging U.S. campaigns and Israel campaigns. And you have a significant change in the legal discourse by the start of the diplomatic conferences of, what, 1974 to 1977. Hannah Arendt's uh, origins of totalitarianism. This is basically her idea, but he's taken it. You might put it most challengingly like this. Rights were once the first prerogative of citizens, but in our contemporary forms of internationalism, they're the last chance of humans to whom we can't extend citizenship or who don't have it on their own. Now, even if you want to claim that this distinction is not as great as I'm presenting, it still seems worth reckoning with. Uh, if we uh, think about human rights, we typically think about the suffering of other people, typically in the third world, which was never the primary location of talk about the rights of man. And even if there's some continuity, there's some major discontinuity which has to be reckoned with. So it's not on my chart that people hadn't yet discovered our words. They hadn't really stumbled on our project yet. And that's what I want to emphasize. So how did we come to it? Well, leaving ancient history aside, the first stage clearly has to be the 1940s. After all, there is a universal declaration of human rights then. How do we think about the 1940s. It gets the lion's share of attention. And if you'll permit my religious church history analogy to continue, it's always treated as the moment of enunciation. And it is the moment when the phrase human rights enters the English language. And it is terrifically important. Now let me uh, turn a bit skeptical for a bit. This typical story that's set on the idea that the 40s are a moment of breakthrough, uh, which would begin in already in 1941, before the Americans enter the war with the Atlantic Charter. I don't know if you know what that is, but it's a, it's a document that FDR and Churchill produce uh, to, to say, what is this war about, even though the Americans can't be driven into it until they're bombed? And they say it's about four freedoms freedoms of speech and religion, and the freedom from want, and freedom from fear, which people tend to think the last means something like a secure world in which war doesn't continuously crop up. That scene is the point of origin, although at that point, human rights have not entered high politics. It's not that phrase uh, has to wait until 1942. Somehow, 
there's a line trace from that Atlantic Charter through the 1948 Universal Declaration. Now, I want to suggest that we look more closely at the 40s, and instead of seeing them just as simple enunciation, uh, look more carefully at a kind of two big stages in the history of the human rights idea. Now, what does it really mean in these early forms? Because as of 42, FDR does start to talk about it uh, as part of a list. And it's true that American international lawyers do start to get excited about it. And they do things like draft potential lists for an international bill of rights in 42 and 3. Uh, what do we say about, uh, about those, uh, those human rights? I think the first thing to say so apparently in, in Australia now, you need a prescription for nicotine, <laughs> nicotine products. So Australia is a much less free country than the United States. Uh, Australia puts a much higher premium on fairness. Americans put a much higher premium on freedom. So America developed uh, when, when the Enlightenment project was just getting started, while Australia never had a revolution. It uh, developed after the Enlightenment. It was a different mindset. So Australia, England, New Zealand, countries that emphasize fairness. And so they think it's, oh, it's unfair to make it easy for people to do something destructive, such as to get access to uh, nicotine products. So uh, as an American who's particularly on the right, all right, you're going to find Australia and, and Europe to be uh, like, like uh, nanny states compared to your American experience? Is that they mean something different for most people. Most people understand them to signify that the war is about the creation of social democracy. If you ask people, what are we fighting for? It's against Nazi tyranny, though not the Holocaust. But uh, it's a new order vision. It's what we're fighting for is something positive and will involve some sort of social democracy. The Brits say that. Even FDR, as famously in 1944, gives a State of the Union address in which he announces a second Bill of Rights, which would cover social and economic rights. Uh, there's not much implication, actually, if you survey uses in the 40s, that they have an internationalist bearing. True, they define a kind of outcome for all civilized states. But it's fairly clear that it's still going to be the state that's the forum of right, just as before. Uh, and actually, FDR has to be pushed in the direction of having international organization, what eventually becomes the United Nations. So it's not obvious, even though international lawyers are, start to get excited briefly about the idea of human rights, that it involves a kind of drive towards international law or international legal protection. Instead, the dominant meaning in those first couple of years is at home. Now, even worse, we have to see what the relationship of the Atlantic Charter is to the big world. I've been talking about an anchor. So until the 1970s, human rights, it was taken for granted that it was something that a state afforded its citizens. It wasn't just uh, any individual in the world being born and uh, deserving them. Anglo-American idea. But uh, if you look out at the world, the Atlantic Charter is actually extremely exciting around the world. But it's not because it promises social democracy. Instead, it promises the self-determination of peoples. A collective principle that had been introduced back in the day by Lenin and Wilson. Uh, and uh, interestingly, there, there's a dispute over what that phrase means at the Atlantic. Right, Lenin, meaning Vladimir Ilyich Lenin, the Soviet dictator, and uh, President Woodrow Wilson of the United States. Charter. Immediately, there's vast enthusiasm around. So both Lenin and Woodrow Wilson were appalled by colonialism and imperialism. On the world, and that's for sure about the Atlantic Charter because of this self-determination principle. It seems to mean that empire is out, but Churchill, doesn't see it that way. The Atlantic Charter is about Hitler's empire, not his empire. And it's not about empire in general. And he actually succeeds in convincing FDR of this fact by the end of the day of, of FDR's life. 
And so in a sense, if we look carefully, we see that self-determination and human rights are in a kind of hydraulic relationship. Human rights for most of the world turns out to be a kind of consolation prize. What they're not getting uh, is self-determination and human rights is given instead. In part because the major powers don't see human rights having any implications for the end of empire. That's quite important. As late as the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, self-determination is not in the idea of human rights. And I think when we look and do a differential history around the world, it shouldn't be surprising that there's such enthusiasm about the Atlantic Charter and almost none about the Universal Declaration outside the North Atlantic zone. And I think that should be sobering. Uh, but uh, even at home, uh, there's a story to tell, uh, not about the realization of human rights in the Universal Declaration, but about their scuttling. Uh, and I don't want to get into too much detail given the rapidly advancing time, but the story would go roughly like this. There's lots of idealistic talk once FDR is brought around to the idea of international organization about what it, what it will involve. Maybe it will involve human rights. But as of 1944, when the first drafts uh, are announced, or leaked actually, uh, so Elliot Blatt says you'll have to take my nicotine from my cold, dead, nicotine-stained hands. I, I can't beat that line. That that's the best. This show cannot improve from that insight. God bless Elliot Blatt. God bless you, and God bless America. Bye bye.